Hey, Ron Stokes, what's going on? I, um, I'm making this video for you. So you said right here, you said, I have a favor to ask. Can you talk about maturity in Christ? I'm really curious on the subject. So I wanted to share with you, speaking of maturity, it's interesting. The way that they translated maturity is in one place they put virtue and in another place they put perfection or perfect so I'm gonna open Google as well because I can't always remember the wording so if I type in the famous chapter 1st Corinthians chapter 13 this word that was translated charity actually means love so if you actually were to go down here towards the bottom he says when I was a child I spake as a child I understood as a child I thought as a child but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And he's talking about right up here where he says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now let's look at that word perfect. It's teleos. It means mature. So it says right here, <clears throat> brought to its end, finished. Wanting nothing necessary to completeness. Perfect. That which is perfect. Consummate human integrity and virtue of men, full-grown, adult, of full age, mature. So from the context here, it's not speaking of some sort of end time thing, it's speaking of now, like when we come to the maturity that we understand God is in charge. As it says in Matthew 18, 20, a verse I always share, because it says that Christ is in the midst of us when we come together and and that's anywhere. You take that anywhere. It's not talking about going to a building on a Sunday. It's talking about anywhere you go where two or three are gathered, just like right here. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And as Christians, people are not supposed to try to avoid conversations about God. That's why you see nobody talking about God anywhere. So part of your Christian maturity is going to have to do with that, about Bearing your cross, counting the cost, people not liking you for doing that, you know. So right here again, I want you to see the context here. First Corinthians 13 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And love is what he's talking about, being the perfect. Because in Colossians 3 14, it says, and above all these things, put on Charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Teleos. Teleotes. Perfectness is the same word. It just has a, a different ending there. So perfection, the state of the more intelligent, moral and spiritual perfection. Um, you, I'm always careful about when the people bring in things like saying intelligence because as we know from Isaiah chapter 29 your Christian walk has nothing to do with how smart you are so when it says intelligence I'm not exactly sure like there is the aspect of you do learn more but that's not to do with like the w loving one another because we wouldn't like try to wave how much we know over people is that the idea so that goes along with charity with love and the way it said put on charity which is the bond of perfectness which is maturity so right here in Isaiah 29 he says <clears throat> and this is speaking to that intelligence thing so he says and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed which men deliver to one that is learned saying read this I pray thee and he saith I cannot for it is sealed and the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. So the learned person couldn't read it because it's sealed. The 
person here couldn't read it, he says, because I'm not learned. Wherefore, Yahweh say, said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So, people try to teach people about God with their own precepts and with their own curriculums and their own academic type learning, but the truth is, is God reveals, so it has nothing to do with how learned you are, like it says there in verse 11, they know a lot and they don't understand, and here, this, these people don't know anything, and they still don't understand, but God has to open the book in our hearts, so let me let me see if I can find that real fast in Revelation chapter 5. I believe it is. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And that's speaking of Christ, because he opens the book in our heart. He is the only one who can open our understanding by revelation to know the things belonging to, belonging to God. So, not on tables of stone. Uh, one second, let me see. I'm going to type in fleshy tables. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 3, 3 here. And remember, this is all in the context of maturity at, in Christ, because we understand that it has nothing to do with how smart you are or how unlearned you are but how much you love, because that's the bond of perfectness. That's the seeing face to face the scripture talks about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So he says right here, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Do we like puff ourselves up and say, look how good we are? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Do we need people to tell us we're doing well in our Christian walk? This is talking about maturity. We don't need people to tell us whether or not we're doing well well, because God is who we stand or fall to, and God will deal with us. We just proclaim the word, and if people don't listen, we get away from them, because we don't want to be leavened by their leaven and their false doctrine and the way that they're trying to make themselves kings. That's called the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the leaven of Herod, the way that people puff themselves up, that's what leaven does to bread. It's yeast. Yeast causes bread to puff up. So, Ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So, he goes on to say, In such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is God. As we just said, God is working through us, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But, it, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance which glory was to be done away how shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather rather glorious for if the ministration of condemnation be glory much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And that has to do with the love, that has to do with not 
trying to sound too intelligent and not trying to make people feel stupid. So we're speaking still of maturity and how you have to come to a place where the darkness is stripped away and now you can see the light and speak of the light. So he goes on to say, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. But we all with open face, beholding as in the glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So just as it said in 1 Corinthians 13, look through the glass darkly, but then face to face, as our love increases. Right here, he says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And we're still talking about maturity. That's why I had mentioned that Colossians 14, because that's what it says. Put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. Only once you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, can you love your brother as yourself. It has to be in that order, or you're not even loving your brother properly. So another great one in this regard is in Galatians chapter 3. Let me see. Let me see where it is. One moment, please. Let me see. Okay, so right here it says, it, it, it's explaining, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Again, see how he's talking about being in the darkness until you can see through the glass, which is the fact that you love your brother, and you, you love God, and you love your brethren. And if you don't have that, then whatever you're doing is a, is a misconception, it's confusion, and it's darkness. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength is the first thing you have to do before you can even love your brethren are you still sitting in darkness so it goes on to say but after that faith has come we are no longer under schoolmasters because God is teaching you now for ye are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ it's not talking about being dunked in water it's talking about having a new conscience God cleansing your conscience and now you're profitable for the kingdom because you're wearing Christ. You've put on Christ. Nothing to do in that statement has anything to do with dunking someone in water. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. So it's speaking of maturity there as well. Okay, let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and fairness. That's what equity means. To give subtility to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Unlike in Psalm 1, where it talks about walking in evil counsels, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So he's giving you a statement of what proverbs are and how they work. And you have to be away from evil 
to begin to see the truth because if you're still involved with evil, you're in darkness and you're in you're being leavened with maliciousness and wickedness like it speaks of when it speaks of leaven. You got to put on the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So it says <clears throat> to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You you can't correct a fool. You can't. It's impossible. That's why you have to separate from them. Because they won't receive correction. It's like when the scriptures say, Go from the presence of the fool when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. God is our father, and Jerusalem is our mother. The scripture teaches, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us wait for blood, let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as those that go down into the pit. Now this is figurative language on how people want to destroy you. It's not just saying this for no reason, it's warning you that these wicked men don't have anything good in mind for you. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our house with spoil. That's what the false Christians do in these meg these churches, not just mega churches, small home churches. Grandma. Grandma might be wicked. You know, you have to learn that grandma or mom or dad might be wicked. <laughs> it's just something you have to deal with eventually as a Christian. We shall find all precious substance, we shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. We'll divide the money. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to do evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. So right there, that is a, such an important statement because he's saying the exact same things that are said in Psalm 1, when it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of sc the scornful. So you don't want to walk around with those guys. You don't want to be involved with that. Get away from that. Get a, Don't take counsel with them. All of that was just discussed in Proverbs chapter 1. And then he finishes it before he goes on to speak of wisdom, speaking the same exact thing that 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says. Or starting in verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So he was just warning you that people are greedy for gain. And if you don't realize how deep that goes, you're missing what's happening around you. Like, bury my father. This right here, when this guy tells Jesus, allow me to go bury my father, it has to do with inheritance. Let me see. Another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus says, but Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Because that's the thing, is people are constantly chasing inheritance of a person who dies. They want the money. Greedy of gain. <clears throat> okay. So, there's many verses on, on maturity and growth. One of the words that it says in the scripture is increase. So, Sometimes that actually means to grow. Let me see if I can find an example. Increase. Let me see. One moment, one moment. Increase. Let 
Let me see if this is it. I'm looking for the word Oxano. Oh, there it is. Thank goodness, because sometimes many words have been translated the same when they're actually different Greek words. So I'm going to click on this word Oxano here, and it's going to show me to cause to grow, augment. When we want to mature, we want to grow, to increase, become great. To grow, increase, of plants, of infants, of a multitude of people, of inward Christian growth. So let's look at a few places where this is mentioned. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. So don't stress out. You're going to grow. You're going to grow in time. Which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Let me see. I scrolled down way too far. Sorry. So, another fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30 and some 60 and some 100. So it's speaking of plants, but that's metaphor for spiritual growth. So it goes on. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Speaking of Jesus, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, saying it again, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then again, consider the lilies, and then it is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into the garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree, the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Now, oftentimes people say, all you need is a seed. But the thing is, is Jesus speaks of that seed growing. You don't just have a seed and that's all you all you need. As a grain of mustard seed, it grows into a huge tree. So there will be growth in your life if you are a true Christian. You'll know them by their fruit, the scripture says. He must increase. I must decrease. So that right here, John is saying, Christ must increase and I must decrease. So he has to grow in us and we have to diminish. Self has to go away and the evil and the lust and you have to grow into maturity. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. But when the time of the promise of Junai, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. But the word of God grew and multiplied. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Right here, this is an important place. I'm going to click on this to show you this. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Oftentimes people say, Oh, well, you're talking about meat and they're using milk. Well, this is a condemnation. He's not applauding that they're on milk. He's saying you need to be eating meat, but instead you're drinking milk. For hitherto you're not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For one, while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Like, I listen to John MacArthur, or I listen to this person, or I listen to this person, I listen to Billy Graham. I mean, like, there's so many people that people introduce to other people that it's like, it takes away from your study and your Christian walk with Christ. Who then is Paul, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, with ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gives the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So, God gives the increase, not man. He causes us to grow in Christian maturity. <coughs> So now we're going to look in Hebrews where it says, I'm going to type in strong meat and it's going to bring up Hebrews. So I'll click right here. Hebrews 5.12. He says, for 
the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, use, going out in the world and speaking to people and preaching, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, um, I'm going to send myself a, a picture I actually took that I was going to share with you. And I actually had forgotten that I had taken all these pictures. <laughs> But let me see. And it's going to have to do with this verse here. Let me see. Actually, one moment. I'll be right back. I'm just going to um, hold this up there. And hope you see it. This is from Dumbing Us Down by John Gatto. But over here, he's speaking of Socrates right here. And right here, he's speaking of how Socrates taught. So I'm just going to read it to you. He says, he says, Is it any wonder Socrates was outraged at the accusation he took money to teach? Even then, philosophers saw clearly the inevitable direction the professionalization of teaching would take, that of preempting the teaching function, which, in a healthy community, belongs to everyone. The teaching function belongs to everyone because you dialogue and you speak back and forth. That's called dialectic. But he goes on to say, All the peripheral tendencies of childhood are nourished and magnified to a grotesque extent by schooling. So schooling is to extend your childhood, not to educate you, through its hidden curriculum prevents effective personality development. Indeed, without exploiting the fearlessness, selfishness, and inexperience of children, our schools could not survive at all, nor could I as a certified school teacher. No common school that actually dared to teach the use of critical thinking tools like the dialectic, the heuristic, or other devices that free minds should employ would last very long before being torn to pieces. In our secular society, school has become the replacement for church. School has replaced church. And like church, it requires that its teaching must be taken on faith. <laughs> so um, let me read that again. No common school that actually dared to teach the use of critical thinking tools, like the dialectic and heuristic. Heuristic means to cause someone to be self-educated, and dialectic means to actually communicate back and forth or other devices that free minds should employ, we as free minds should employ these, would last very long. The school wouldn't last very long because it would be torn to pieces. So I wanted to read that to you because it, it links the um, dialectic method of teaching, which is why they killed Socrates. And um, here, let, I want to share another... another book with you. Like I said, this was Dumbing Us Down by John Gatto. And now I'm going to share with you something from pagan Christianity that speaks of the same thing. Let me see. Okay. So, it says, Socrates, oh, one moment. Here we go. Questions we never think to ask. Socrates, 470 to 399 BC, BC, is considered by some historians to be the father of philosophy. Born and raised in Athens, his custom was to go about the town relentlessly raising questions and analyzing the popular views of his day. Socrates believed that the truth is found by dialoguing extensively about an issue and relentlessly questioning it. This method is known as dialectic or the Socratic method. He thought freely on matters that his fellow Athenians felt were closed for discussion. So he was raising questions. Socrates' habit of pelting people with searching questions and roping them into critical dialogues about their accepted customs eventually got him killed. His incessant questioning of tightly held traditions provoked the leaders of Athens to charge him with corrupting the youth. As a result, they put Socrates to death. 
a clear message was sent to his fellow Athenians, all who question the established customs will meet the same fate. Socrates was not the only provocateur to reach severe reprisal for his nonconformity. Isaiah was sawn in half, according to tradition. John the Baptist was beheaded, and Jesus was crucified, not to mention the thousands of Christians who have been tortured and martyred through the centuries by the institutional church because they dared to challenge its teachings. As Christians, we are taught by our leaders to believe certain... Let me see... Okay, I think, yeah, that's all I had right there. So, anyways, what happens is people learn a lot of bad habits. They don't think critically. They're not taught to ask questions like the dialectic learning method or self-taught to be self-taught so you can educate yourself through heuristic learning techniques because they want you to think like a child. They want you to act like a child. They don't certainly don't want you to act like a mature Christian who knows how to ask the right questions. So that actually had led me to another verse of scripture I wanted to share, but now it got away from me. Um, I, I was thinking of it, but okay, okay, yeah, that's right. Second Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. <clears throat> so you have to have these things, or you're blind. All eight of these things, faith, and the seven things you add to faith. It says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you have those things mentioned up there. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. So let's look at that word virtue, because that means manliness. So you got to have manliness, erite prowess as a prowess in a battlefield so it says a virtuous course of thought feeling and action virtue moral goodness any particular moral excellency as modesty purity so right here it says a word of very wide signification in Greek any excellence of a person in body or mind or of a thing an eminent endowment property or quality use of the human mind, and in the ethical sense, it denotes a virtuous course of thought, feeling, and action, virtue, moral goodness, any particular moral excellence, his power, excellencies, perfections, which shine forth. So I have another book, and it explains that it means prowess, as prowess in a battlefield, it also means manliness, as in maturity. So Another way of looking at this is umum, I, I can't remember, is it urum and thumen? Let's see. Hey, I spelt it right. I can't believe it. So this actually means lights and perfections, this right here. And it has to do with having truth, which is light, and having order which is the perfections and being mature. So, and he put the breastplate upon him and he put in the breastplate the Urim and the Thummim. You need to have light and order in your heart, right? So put it in the breastplate. L Urim lights, stones kept in the pouch of the high priest's breastplate, used in determining God's decisions in certain questions and issues. Right here it says lights, metaphorically revelations, revelation use of the sacred lot of the Hebrews.
thumen, perfection. So in our heart, we have to become mature. We have to have light. We have to have revelations. Thumen, perfection. Stones provided for the means of achieving a sacred lot. Used with the umen, the will of God was revealed. Wholeness, integrity, fullness, safety, prosperity, integrity, and innocence. And these definitions we've looked at have been the one before over when we're looking at teleos, which means perfection, which means maturity. That was, we were looking in Thayer and in Strong's, and now we're looking at Jacinius, Hebrew Chaldee. Okay, so one last verse. Be ye perfect, as God is perfect. It means mature. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Be mature. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All right, so I hope that this helps, Ryan, and um, take it easy, and I hope that you learned some things from this and that this has been beneficial. All right, take it easy, man. Bye.